Hi. How are you? Um, you can call me Gio. Uh, and I'm very excited to talk to you about query understanding and to open up the search track at Berlin Buzzwords. Um, before I get started, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I spent probably five or six years in the finance industry working for a subsidiary of Standard & Poor's. And there I built uh, a database, real-time processing system, and a search engine for globally sourced financial documents. Um, my life there was just like endless data gymnastics, and it was challenging and fun to work, but uh, eventually I made a break for it and moved on to Etsy, which is a marketplace for handmade goods, not unlike eBay, for example. Uh, and at Etsy, I spent six and a half years focused mostly on search and on data-driven product development. I led the search experience team, which was sort of responsible for more or less anything the user would interact with uh, when they were dealing with search, so stuff like facets, the result presentation, auto-suggest, uh, mobile, uh, our taxonomy, um, you name it. And then I went on to lead the search ranking team, which was responsible for the fairness and effectiveness of Etsy's core search algorithm. And then about a year ago, I left to start my own company called Related Works, and we're a small consultancy that tries to sort of bring a human touch to search and data problems. So if you would like to work with us or are interested in speaking about that, please see me afterwards. Um, and today, what I really want to do is give you a great mental model for how to think about query understanding and how to apply that to the search engines that you probably all know and love. And we're going to do that by first talking about why you might be interested in query understanding, you know, why this is a strategy that, that should be appealing to you. Then we're going to uh, set a foundation and a definition for the approach before applying that definition to a series of user problems that you may encounter. Um, and we'll use this to sort of really get familiar and get the nuts and bolts of query understanding. Uh, and then before finishing up, we'll talk about what's at stake when you do this sort of work. So why query understanding? Well, what are we trying to do? You're probably at the search track because you have some search, some search engine that you care about and that you want to make better. And I would argue that as architects of information retrieval systems, you know, our goal has historically been this mystical notion of relevance. Uh, and it's probably been defined dozens of times, and you've probably heard this a lot, but just so we're all on the same page, let's sort of go back to information retrieval 101 and kind of formally define the problem. So we start with a user that has some information need, right? Maybe it's a student that wants to understand why Pluto is no longer a planet. And there's some information out in the universe, maybe it's in a teacher's brain, maybe it's on a website, that can satisfy that need, that can help them answer that question. And so our task, the task of relevance, is to really bridge this divide between the information in the universe and the user. But one thing I want you to really focus on throughout this talk is that, unfortunately, we're not dealing with users and information. We're sort of dealing with a proxy battle, right? On the user side, instead of the user, what we have is typically some sort of keywords that they may have typed into a text box or that a question they may have asked their home assistant. And on the information side, the systems that we build typically represent information as documents. So on Google, a document might be a website. On Etsy, it might be uh, a dress that someone's trying to sell. So relevance in this case becomes finding the document that satisfies the underlying information need. But we have to infer that the document has that information, and we have to infer what the user means. So query understanding is a tool that we can use to achieve relevance. And so a natural question is, what are other tools that we might be able to use? And, and why is query understanding any better? So as motivating context, we're going to talk about two alternatives. Uh, and the first is something I'm going to call statistical relevance. And the idea is pretty straightforward. So given a document and a query, we're going to do a little bit of simple math. And we're going to come up with a number for how relevant this document is to this query. And the key insight for a lot of statistical relevance methods is that we can use our corpus to infer the importance of a specific document. And the most sort of canonical example of this is TF-IDF. And, and here's a gross simplification of TF-IDF that looks nothing like what you'll find on Wikipedia. And I've added the terms that are in square brackets. And of course, there's tons of other examples of statistical relevance. There's InfoGain, BM25, which is now the default in Lucene. Um, but they all share sort of common traits. Um, and I want you to notice that if we look at this definition of TF-IDF, it's, it's hyper-focused on documents, right? But what if your documents are actually misleading you? And what's more, where's the user in this equation? 
Now, you could argue that the user is providing a set of keywords that we use for retrieval, right, to get a set of candidates. And then we use this math to score those candidates. But is that enough? Let's look at an example. So this is Flipkart, uh, an e-commerce company from India that recently just got acquired by Walmart. And I'm searching for fanny packs. And for uh, the British folks in the audience, that this may be really confusing to you. But I want to highlight that there are almost no results. And I, I can assure you those are not fanny packs. Um, but if you search for bum bags, you will find what us Americans like to refer to as uh, fanny packs. And there's tons of them there. And I think this highlights a very, very common problem, which is that users and documents almost are always are speaking different languages. Um, the content in our search engines are often, is often you know, lovingly and, and, and arduously crafted by people that are specialists, right? People like the folks in this room that live and breathe their subject matter every single day. And so they have a tendency to use very, very specific nomenclature. And so the layperson that comes to a search engine almost always is going to use much simpler words that, that don't really line up. And what's more demographically, those two sets of humans may be very different, right? An American consumer may be uh, approaching an Indian e-commerce site, and so naturally we're going to have very different language. And of course, maybe your documents are, are being produced by automated systems or robots. Uh, and, and then we can almost assuredly find uh, differences in the language that these two uses. And, and so these differences are sort of fundamental uh, problems for statistical relevance methods. So an alternative is machine learned relevance, uh, or learning to rank. And learning to rank frames relevance as a supervised learning problem. So we'll take an, give a document and a query to a model, and that model will give us back a number. This is called a pointwise model, and it's sort of the simplest incarnation of learning to rank. And the way that we train a point-wise model, or the way that we train a learning to rank model, is by showing it examples. The examples might take the form of a document, a query, and then a yes, no, right? Is this document uh, relevant for this query? And if we show the model enough examples, hopefully the model will learn how to show us the relevant stuff. Now, learning to rank will suffer from a lot of the same problems that other machine learning techniques uh, will suffer from that you'll probably hear a lot of uh, at this conference, right? Acquiring training data is, is difficult. Understanding the biases uh, and the quality of your training data is tremendously difficult. Um, training itself is a subtle art form. And then even if you get lucky and you are successfully trained a model, putting that thing in production right, and having confidence in it and feeling like you have an operable system, these are all tremendous challenges. But these are not even the challenges I want to focus on today. There's a far more insidious problem. And I call it the poisoned result set. So here I'm searching for dress shirt. And you can see that one of these things is clearly not a dress shirt. If a user searches your search engine and finds sort of viscerally irrelevant items, even one or two, at that point, they often lose faith in the ability of your search engine to interpret their queries. right? And at that point, they're sort of going to do one of two things. They're either going to hack around you, either by fastening, using the user experience, uh, or cr crafting really complex queries, or they're just going to decide to go somewhere else. And let's be honest, if you're Amazon, if you're not Amazon, they're probably going to go somewhere else. Now, the interesting thing about viscerally irrelevant items is you can sort of think of it as akin to filtering spam. And we've been filtering spam as an industry for decades. And one thing I want you to notice is nobody uses ranking models to filter spam. They use binary classifiers. Um, because classification and filtering is fundamentally very, very different than ordering result sets. And if you put your faith in a learning to rank model and, and hope that if you showed enough examples, it'll get rid of the irrelevant stuff, you're probably not going to see very great results. Uh, and I myself have personally wasted a lot of time going down this path. So having talked about why these other strategies for relevance are sort of not up to the task or, or have significant drawbacks, we arrive at the star of the show, query understanding. And query understanding is about focusing on queries rather than focusing on documents. But to be more precise, I would say that query understanding is about focusing on intent. Because as we learned in that fanny pack example, language is not sufficient, right? Language can be tremendously misleading. So we sort of have to unpack what the user is getting at and try to figure out that underlying information need.
The holy grail of query understanding is something like this. Uh, given a query, we can break it up into its components, and then we can understand what each of those components mean. And you can get extra credit if you can tie each of these pieces to some entity in your database. If you zoom out a little bit, uh, query understanding is sort of like mapping a query onto a set of facts. And often those facts are, can be arranged in hierarchical or directed relationships, right? So here we're mapping the query dress shirt into the category dress shirts, uh, which is a subcategory of shirts and a subcategory of clothing. And so you can think of these facts as making up a graph, right? A knowledge graph. And if you map your documents onto the same set of knowledge, you've built a bridge from your documents to your users based on semantics. Now, before you go back to your boss and tell them that Geo told you that the solution to all your problems is a knowledge graph, let's take a break. <laughs> um, knowledge graphs are a thing. People build them. They use them. They're tremendously effective, but also complex tools. Uh, and really what I'm talking about right now is I'm using knowledge graphs as a metaphor for how I think about knowledge, knowledge how I think about query understanding. And let's roll with that metaphor for a second. And the interesting thing about knowledge is that there's a lot of it. In October of 2016, uh, Google's knowledge graph supposedly had around 70 billion facts. And chances are good that nobody in this room has the resources that they can throw at the problem that Google does. So the rest of us have to sort of pick and choose. We have to figure out what's the right knowledge to focus on. Chances are good that your distribution of queries looks something like this. There are some head of queries that are issued quite frequently and make up a sizable portion of your traffic. So on Etsy, this might be something like Harry Potter. And then there's this long tail of queries that are issued very infrequently, um, like Ithaca's gorgeous t-shirt red. And a natural place to start in your query understanding journey is to focus on the head, right? There's not that many queries here and we can sort of have a huge impact on our users. And when you move beyond the head, it might make sense to focus on cases like this fanny pack example, where users are clearly having difficulty, right? Where there's, there's gaps to be made up. But regardless of how you proceed, what I really want you to take away from this is there's too much knowledge out in the universe, so we have to focus on figuring out what the most important knowledge to imbue in our systems is. And the right way of doing that is by taking a look at your query logs and closely scrutinizing what users are doing. And of course, if you want to do that in a GDPR, GDPR compliant way, you should be asking for permission, so and so and so and so. But taking that for granted, um, the rest of this talk will be focused on what sorts of problems you may encounter uh, as you closely scrutinize your query logs and how you might fix them using query understanding. So we're going to talk about two types of problems, uh, precision and recall, and you may be familiar with those two concepts, but here's my two sort of intuitive explanations of each. Um, precision is garbage results, right, like the viscerally, irre viscerally irrelevant dress. Um, and recall problems are cases where we're just not seeing enough stuff, so more akin to the, the fanny pack example. On the precision front, you can usually find these cases by looking for situations where users aren't engaging, right? They're not clicking, they're not exploring, they're just sort of issuing a query and leaving. There are caveats to that definition, by the way, but we'll sort of, gl you know, glaze over that. So it's late 2016, and you just got home from the Beyonce concert, and you're so hopped up on Lemonade that you decide to search for formation, as in Formation World Tour, uh, and this is uh, an e-commerce site called Spring, and instead of Beyonce stuff, you find a bunch of medium format cameras. It's a little disappointing. Um, you search for Beyonce and find a bunch of Beyond the Beach apparel. And you make one last ditch effort and search for Solange and find a bunch of Solana sandals. Um, you've somehow discovered the Knowles Family Bermuda Triangle. Um, be, because you're all search folks, you probably are getting some glimmer of what's happening here. Uh, we have some very aggressive stemming, right? So Beyond and Beyonce are both stemming to Beyond. Format and Formation are both stemming to Format. Um, but this is a very specific instance of a more general problem, which is that we're not handling proper nouns correctly, right? Beyonce, Solange, these are examples of people, places, and things. And, and those are very, very different than your average nouns or verbs. We shouldn't be treating them the same. We need our system to be more intelligent than that. So the easiest thing that you could possibly do 
to solve this problem is go through your query logs and find the list of things that people care about that are entities that shouldn't be stemmed and make a list of exceptions. Now you might be saying to yourself, is Geo really suggesting that we go through our query logs and manually put together a list of entities? And that's absolutely what I'm suggesting because your users really don't care how smart you are. And if we think back to that query distribution, right, if you work on that head, there's not that many queries there, right? You can sit down with a spreadsheet and, and sort of figure out the important entities in an hour, maybe two. And that will have sort of outsized effects on, on your search engine. But you don't have to stop there, right? We can do more. So a sort of medium level solution is to start using data to help you find these entities. So maybe you're lucky and you have uh, an artist field in your database. Uh, so you can sort of select distinct from your artist field and get a list of things that you should never treat uh, as, as, as allowing to be stemmed. Uh, or maybe uh, you can consult external data sources. So for instance, if R&B artists were particularly important, Wikipedia has a nice uh, list of them. Uh, and depending on your domain, I'm sure there are other resources that will be tremendously useful for you to find the proper nouns in your space. Uh, and then of course, the hardest possible solution is to use something like a part of speech tagger or a named entity recognition system. Uh, thankfully, there are tons of these uh, that you can sort of use off the shelf. Some of them are software that you install. Some of them, some of them are cloud hosted uh, APIs. But one thing I want to caution you about is that remember that a lot of these systems are trained on natural language, right? They're trained on prose. They're trained on text that's arranged in pages and sentences and proper nouns are usually capitalized. And well, it turns out that that's really not what queries are like. Uh, so for instance, here's uh, Google's cloud NLP API just failing miserably to understand what Beyonce is. Um, so a better strategy is to use one of these systems on your documents. Um, and so we can use them to find the list of entities. Uh, and if you want to be extra sure about what you're uh, exempting from stemming, you can have a human being review that uh, and give you a really high quality set of entities that you're going to respect. Let's talk about this dress problem. Uh, we searched for a dress shirt and we, we ended up with a dress that's made out of t-shirt material. Now, the problem here is we're not respecting phrases, right? When I, when I say dress shirt, I don't mean a thing that is a dress and a shirt. I mean literally a dress shirt, right? That's a phrase that we should be respecting. And again, the easiest possible solution is go through your query logs and figure out the phrases. Can't say this enough. Um, but uh, a more sophisticated solution is some simple heuristics. So for instance, we could use something like uh, point-wise mutual information. So you can go through your query logs or your documents and you can calculate the probability of seeing dress shirt together as a phrase and compare that to the denominator in this case, which is the probabilities of dress and shirt appearing independently. And you can calculate this number for each set of pair of words in your corpus and then decide, you know, anything with a PMI above five, we're going to call that a phrase that we're going to respect. Uh, and this is tremendously simple, very effective, uh, sort of no excuse to try to try it. No excuse to not try it. Um, another very popular technique, which uh, might seem funny, is you can actually just check, check Wikipedia. And this is sort of state of the art when it comes to heuristic approaches um, to detecting phrases. If a, if a phrase exists in a database like Wikipedia, it's probably a real thing, and you should probably treat it as a phrase. Um, and then, of course, the hardest possible path is supervised learning. So we can train a model given two tokens to decide whether or not that token is a phrase. Uh, folks will often use uh, features like frequency in the query logs, both independent and together. They'll use PMI, like we discussed earlier. Uh, and folks will also use stuff like, you know, did this phrase appear in Wikipedia or some other domain source. Um, I want to let you know, though, that if you're looking for more literature on the subject, you'll find that um, folks talk about this as query segmentation. Um, so instead of deciding whether or not two tokens are a phrase, uh, you're really talking about should we divide the query uh, at, in the line between these two tokens. Uh, and that's confusing in this conversation, but it makes sense when you think about um, that holy grail of query understanding where we need to first kind of break up the query into pieces and then understand each of those pieces. So 
Uh, you can start as simple as something like a logistic regression, uh, but things get much more complicated. Uh, folks also use recurrent neural networks. Uh, here's a diagram of a, a linear chain conditional random fields model. Um, needless to say, I think you can get started and, and sort of have outsized effects without getting this complicated, but, but folks take it all the way. Um, all right, and so for our last precision example, I'm going to uh, search Etsy for dress. And you can notice that one of these things is not a dress. Uh, it's actually a pattern that you can use to sew your own dress. And one thing that you may not realize about Etsy is that we have, or uh, that Etsy has both, all right, my slides are not moving. Sorry. There we go. Um, so Etsy has both finished goods and craft supplies, like fabric and scissors, uh, and the sorts of things that you might use to craft your own goods. And so uh, the problem in this case is that we have very ambiguous keywords, right? Dress appears in the finished goods, but it also appears in the craft supplies. Um, and if we knew if the query was one of those two things, we might be able to do better. And so the solution here is something called query classification, which really just means we're gonna take our query and we're gonna map it to a set of buckets, right? Is this query a craft supply query or is it a finished goods query? And it often makes sense to start with very broad categories like this. Um, and if, if these categories solve the problem, right? If filtering out all the craft supplies would really just fix those results, that's definitely the place to start. But folks also get a lot deeper, right? So instead of just those two buckets, uh, it's not uncommon to see people classifying things into a deep hierarchy, right? So in this case, we would uh, classify dress as the category dresses, which is under women's, which is under clothing. Um, but I would only go here if the first sort of broad set of categories doesn't solve your problem. Because as you go more granular, it's gonna get harder and harder. Um, and the easiest possible solution is just have a human being provide some mappings, right? And that may be you know, something as simple as always treat this query as finished goods, um, or it might be a little bit more sophisticated, like here's some heuristics, right? If they mention fabrics or patterns, then let's treat that as craft supplies. Um, then a medium level solution is to start using data. So for instance, we could start taking a look at our query logs and look at what people are engaging with. Uh, and even though there are craft supplies in the results, I can almost guarantee you that most people are engaging with the actual dresses. And so if 90% of the time people are clicking on finished goods, this is probably a finished goods query. Though I should caution, you can only do this for queries that actually get a reasonable amount of traffic, right? If, if a query only has like one or two searches or one or two clicks, like this is just totally unreasonable. Um, Another very simple technique is just lexical similarity, right? How close is the query um, in terms of its text to the text of one of your categories? Um, so in this case, dress, if you stem it, is basically identical to dresses, and there may not be any other category that it's close to, in which case it's, it's fairly unambiguous and it's fairly obvious. And this, by the way, is one of the things that I'm most embarrassed about as an industry, right? Like how many search engines have you gone to where clicking on dress and searching for the keyword dress give you completely different things? Uh, and in, it's like, it's inexcusable, right? Like we have like autonomous vehicles, but we can't like facet and search by the same token. It's crazy. Um, so anyways, then of course the hardest pos possible path is supervised learning again. Um, here we're mapping, we're training a model to put things into one of these buckets for us. Um, People often start with a simple bag of words representation, um, but we'll, you know, it's also common these days to use word embeddings from something like word to vec um, A natural extension of the probability ideas that we talked about earlier is to use something like a naive Bayes classifier. So instead of calculating the probability of a class given a query, we can calculate the probability of each token of a class given each token and then we can combine those into a query level probability. So this will kind of let you cover more queries than the system we talked about earlier. Um, but you know, it gets real bananas from there. So here's uh, an example of some research where uh, folks are taking word embeddings from word to vec combining them using a convolutional neural network, uh, and then feeding those to a tree-based classifier. So a full spectrum of, of approaches that you can take. So that's it for recall. Uh, precision, and we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about recall. Uh, 
you can usually find these cases uh, by looking for instances where users really just aren't seeing enough results. Um, and, and I think that definition needs to be a little bit more expansive than zero results. Like zero is bad, but like two is also bad. Um, so, so let's look at some of these. Uh, first, the fanny pack example. And if we think back to our knowledge graph metaphor, the problem here is, you know, we're missing this mapping on the left-hand side, right? We know what our documents are, but we don't know what our queries are and, and how they map into that. Um, so what we really need is we need to understand that fanny packs are a thing that exists in the universe and that, uh, that this fact is synonymous with uh, the idea of bum bags in our database. Uh, so I'm really just talking about synonyms, and you all have probably used synonyms before. Uh, and in fact, the synonyms in by default in things like Elasticsearch and Solar are human powered. So we have uh, great evidence of smart people coming before us and using their, their manual labor. Uh, and so continuing on that trend, uh, going through your query logs and figuring out the important synonyms is a totally reasonable thing to do. Um, a, a medium level solution is to again consult data sources uh, like WordNet. Uh, so WordNet's a lexical database. You can use it to look up relationships between words. Uh, you could look, use Wikipedia or whatever domain source may be particularly useful for your search engine. Uh, here's an example of me using WordNet and it, you know, it's accurate but not tremendously useful. Um, but Wikipedia comes to the rescue. Um, and again, it's, it's sort of surprising how, how easily you can harvest a, a number of really good synonyms and other facts to add to your system if you just take half an hour and look through some of these domain sources. Uh, and then the most sophisticated possible approach is trying to automatically detect synonyms. So for instance, you might pass your query logs through something like word to vec uh, and then look at the nearest neighbors for each word. Uh, here I'm looking, it's a little hard to see, but I'm looking at the word probable and the nearest neighbor is likely. Um, but I'll be honest, I very much handpicked this example. Uh, the results are like stupendously terrible uh, in, ger in general, and after having read a number of papers about automatic synonym detection, I can very confidently tell you that the state of the art is pretty bad. Um, <laughs> so this might be one of those examples where um, it might make sense to kind of use these systems to identify a set of candidates, right? They're, they're not good at being accurate, but they're good at highlighting possible relationships, uh, and it's very easy for someone to review those relationships and kind of pick and choose the good ones. Um, so for our last recall example, I searched red NASCAR at the Digital Public Library of America. This is a, a site that aggregates digital collections from libraries all over the US. Uh, it's a great site if you're looking for like sort of archival uh, photographs and all sorts of like interesting stuff that no one's ever seen. Uh, and you can see that there's almost no results for NASCAR. Uh, there's almost no results and none of them are red, right? Tremendous bummer. But if we search for NASCAR, there's tons of results and the top ones are red and really could this guy get any redder or any more NASCAR? Um, so the red NASCAR stuff is there somewhere. We're just, we're missing it, right? It, even if we got good, even if we were really good at understanding the query, um, our documents aren't being mapped into that same space, right? We don't know the color of our documents. Uh, so the easiest possible solution is to ask human beings. Uh, and maybe you have the sort of search engine where people are submitting data to your system uh, on an iOS app or on a web form. That's a great place to ask for more and you'll oftentimes be surprised by how willing people are to give you this information. Um, but there's tons of heuristics and off-the-shelf software you could use as well. So for instance, here is a, uh, a Python library called Color Thief that you can use to get the dominant color of an image or the color palette. Um, of course, this leaves as an exercise to everyone in the audience mapping these RGB values to human readable names. If you're trying to do like high-level colors like English, black, blue, etc., cetera, uh, that's very straightforward. But if you want to get to like periwinkle salmon level, uh, that's a much harder problem and maybe a little crazy. Um, another thing I want to highlight is a lot of times when we're missing data, right, when we're missing that mapping, the data may be somewhere in your system. So for instance, here I'm looking at the tags for an item and there's clearly sizing information there. Uh, but maybe you haven't extracted or indexed that sizing information and really some healthy amount of regex and sort of data munging can kind of get you 80% of the way there. Uh, and that's what this work often looks like. And then of course the hardest possible path is to use machine learning. 
So for instance, we might uh, train a convolutional neural network to sort of place our images into specific color bands. Um, you probably don't want to train your own from scratch. You may want to transfer learn from a, an existing architecture. Um, again, needless to say, I don't, I don't think you have to go all the way here uh, in order to fill in these gaps or, to, or in order to make some, some headway. So by now, I hope you've noticed some patterns. Uh, the easiest possible solution, whether it's you know, dealing with entities, synonyms, uh, color tags for images, is just to leverage human beings, right? It turns out we're pretty damn good at stuff. Um, so, you know, don't, don't be afraid to utilize humans. And one thing I want to make clear is, I think you'll find that human beings are going to be exceptionally fantastic at helping you with that head of the distribution. But they will also have effects on the long tail, right? Because often long tail queries are variations on the head. So if I get good at understanding that Harry Potter is a phrase, um, the head query Harry Potter will do better, but also the tail query Harry Potter t-shirt red, that'll do just as well. Um, the medium level solution is usually something like using data, probabilities, using simple heuristics or off the shelf software. Um, and what's great about these approaches is they're usually very straightforward. Um, they are usually quite performant and they're very easy to understand which are all fantastic elements for a production system. So please don't un underestimate this class of solutions. Um, and then the hardest possible thing that you could do is try to train your own AI or machine learning systems. And what I think you'll find is that while the human beings are great at the head, if you really want to make uh, some, some headway on the tail, right? if you want to make the tail better, you're really going to have to start leveraging data-driven or machine learning techniques. So, Another pattern that I want to highlight is it's very, very common for folks to use data-driven methods um, or machine learning systems to identify candidates of pieces of knowledge that you want to add to your system and then having human beings sort of pick and choose what are really the best pieces of knowledge before adding them to the system. Um, and this is tremendously important uh, and very common because it turns out that um, query understanding is a super high stakes game, right? Um, if I search for clutch and you show me automobile parts, this is a catastrophic failure, right? Like if I, if I really wanted handbags. So we need to be sure about our interpretation of queries. But this also highlights sort of the intersection between query understanding and the user experience, right? If I don't have a lot of confidence in my query understanding, rather than filter the results, I could just suggest that to you and auto-suggest, right? And if you agree with that classification, you'll click on it and have a good time. But if you don't, it's, it's really not the end of the world. And you can really think of this as creating a spectrum uh, from low confidence to high confidence, right? On the low confidence end uh, are a lot of user experience features like auto-suggest, you can mess with faceting, um, you can suggest refinements within the body of the results. Um, and even before we get to filtering, Right, you can give a slight preference. Right? If we think that this is a handbag query, let's give the handbags a little bit of a boost, but let's not completely change everything. Right? So it's really a question of how confident you are in your system. And this is a very precision-oriented spectrum, by the way, but you can imagine a similar spectrum for recall. So that's it. Um, I hope this was helpful. This is really just like the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the few things I want you to take home today are that query understanding is, allows us to achieve a baseline of relevance. And earlier I contrasted query understanding with machine learned relevance and statistical relevance, but really they can all live in harmony, right? We can use query understanding to kind of remove all the irrelevant stuff and get us to like a reasonable spot. And then we can use statistics and machine learning to like fine tune what's happening on top of that. Query understanding achieves that by focusing on intent, right? We have to try to discern what the user is getting at and fix those problems. And we do that by imbuing our search engine with knowledge. And unfortunately, the only reasonable approach is to sort of figure out what knowledge is most important uh, and use data and analytics to do so. So uh, one very quick plug, uh, this is my company. We're a small consultancy and we'd love to help you get started with query understanding. There's my Twitter, Medium, LinkedIn website uh, and there's our blog. Uh, I actually recently just wrote a series about auto-suggest. Uh, if you found this talk interesting, you may find that uh, interesting as well. So thank you. <laughs>
Any questions? Uh, hi, thanks for the talk, it was really nice. Um, yeah, I, most of the tips you gave, I think, were like um, at index time. Could you maybe comment a bit on which of those you would execute at index or query time, something like that? Uh, that's a good question. I didn't get into the mechanics of this, but actually a lot of query understanding um, happens at both of those stages. Um, so at index time, let's say that you're dealing with classifications, you need to know that you know this is a document that belongs to finished goods, we're assuming there that that's already something that you know in your system or that's a, a piece of data that you're missing in. Um, but then a lot of query understanding happens before you even talk to a retrieval system. So often it looks like, you know, we'll have a set of systems that will spit us back a classification or a segmentation for a query. And after query understanding gives us those results, we'll then issue a query to Solar or Elasticsearch that, you know, you, that leverages those, those pieces. I was curious about uh, if you've used query understanding features in a learning to rank model. Yeah, that's actually something I didn't get to, to really talk about, but uh, as I mentioned at the end, all of these things can sort of limit harmony, but it's beyond that, right? Because um, your learning to rank models can leverage the query understanding, right? So if your learning to rank model can understand that this is a clothing query, right, it may pick up on completely different features than, than if it just didn't know anything about the query. So um, yeah, it's tremendously common to, to sort of start by using query understanding to kind of like get you the baseline, but then also incorporating those features into learning to rank models. Um, and the way to think about it is it gives you like, it removes sparsity, right? So then like rather than dealing with like an individual query or the intersection of an individual query or a document, now you can intersect a class of queries or, or an attribute of queries. Hi, uh, a question about uh, LTR and data. Um, you, you said, for the machine learning problem, sometimes the hard part is, is actually getting good data, and I certainly agree with that. It's hard to show people all of your resu possible results and then get them to rank it. But maybe you have an idea where uh, particular user data you can use are uh, more helpful. Uh, is there, in your experience, a class of problems where it's easy to get data for machine learning from user interactions on your site in this whole area? I think in general, it's always a very, very subtle thing. You know, everyone basically starts with like looking at clicks, but clicks are a very, very ambiguous signal. Um, and then it really depends on, you know, understanding what behavior looks like on your on your system and what success is, right? And that's that's really why training data, when you're harvesting training data from behavior, becomes very hard because oftentimes it's very difficult for even us to define in this room what success is, right? Success on an e-commerce site is, is revenue, right? But that's a comparatively very rare event throughout the course of a website, right? So conversions in, are simply not enough in most e most e-commerce settings. But if you're looking at other sort of search engines, like let's talk about Pinterest or something like that, uh, then success is even more sort of ambiguous, right? And so that ambiguity makes it very, very hard to derive like meaningful signal out of, out of your training data. What I will say is I often find from an analytics perspective that it's easier to define failure, right? Like, I may not know if you're having a good time, but I can almost certainly tell you you're having a bad time, right? Like if you spent 10 seconds on the site, unless we're talking about like Google and you got like a knowledge graph call out of like, you know, I searched for like Obama's birthday and I got Obama's birthday as the answer, which is probably no one's problem in this room. Um, unless we're talking about that, it's, it's fairly straightforward to understand abandonment. Yeah. Any last question? Hi, my name is Manos Sagias from uh, 904 Labs. We uh, provide uh, self-learning search engines for e-commerce. So uh, what, what you've been saying, uh, I, I identified very much with it. Um, one of the things that I'd like to ask, perhaps from your experience at Relator Works, but also earlier from, at Etsy, is about the evaluation of these many components that are involved in search, uh, and also uh, individual components, but also an end-to-end -end evaluation, and how would that uh, relate to make a decision uh, to go from easy uh, to medium to hard uh, to answer a particular question. So you're asking when do you move from, from each of these kind of grades? Uh, that is one question and the second question is uh, do you do uh, evaluation per component uh, overall or both? Um, 
in general, I would, you know, for folks that have enough traffic and that have the expertise, I would recommend running A-B experiments. And when you're running A-B experiments, you should always prefer to run the most fine-grained experiment possible, right? Because that's going to give you the clearest signal for what's, for what's working. But A-B experimentation is itself like a very subtle art form. And oftentimes what you'll find is, you know, if we add five synonyms to our system, that's going to affect like a handful of queries, right? And so you really won't have enough traffic to get a meaningful signal out of it. So sometimes out of necessity, you need to make bigger, you know, tests. Um, but in general, I would, I would say get as incremental as, as you possibly can unless you're forced in the other direction, right? Because if you're testing a giant system, when it doesn't work, which that's what's going to happen uh, the first like dozen or so times, you're going to have no idea why it didn't work. Okay, thank you very much.